I will share. We are recording, just so you know. Doug, I will be going off camera for a brief portion of the meeting just to grab dinner, um, but I will turn my video back on when I'm done eating. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Marshall, we are recording. Amherst Media is with us in the house. The attendees are coming in uh, at 6.32. I do believe we're good to go. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of October 4th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When you, I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Uh, we know that Bruce Coldham is absent this evening. Fred Hartwell. Fred Hartwell is present. Thank you. Jesse Major. I am present. Uh, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Uh, and Johanna Newman. I am present. And Karin Winter. Present. Thank you, board members. If technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so uh, the first item on tonight's agenda are, is our minutes. And we have two sets of minutes that were distributed for review by the board. First one uh, going in chronological order was from March 29th of 2023. Um, I know that was a previous board and that we've had a little bit of turnover of members since then. However, uh, I'm hoping we can approve these tonight. Uh, does anyone on the board have any comments on these minutes that they would like to suggest changes to these? Okay, so in that case, 
Would anybody like to make a motion to approve the minutes from March 29th as drafted by our highly capable planning board staff? Johanna. I move to approve both sets of minutes. Well, why don't we just do the first one first? You want to do one? Okay, yeah. great. I move to approve the minutes from, was it May 30th? March 29th. March 29th, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and Karen? I second. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Board members, any further comments or any suggested changes? Nope. All right, so we'll go through and uh, see if I, who wants to approve them. Fred, we'll start with you. I I vote to approve. All right, thank you, Jesse. I'll abstain since I was not yep. present. All right, uh, Janet. I wasn't there either, so I, can I vote on them anyway? It seems I well, guess I, yeah. I guess we're kind of trapped in this loop then because we don't have enough original members from that yeah. meeting. We, we got to get out of uh, how to dodge. I'm going to go. I'm going to cast my faith with Chris and Pam and say yes. Okay. Thank you. Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That is five members in favor, one abstention, and one absence. All right. Now we'll go on to the second set of minutes, which were more recent, which were from August 30th. Just a couple of meetings ago. <clears throat> Board members, any comments on those minutes? I think we were all part of the board at that time, although it looks like Janet was absent on that occasion as well. Jesse, I see your hand. Just a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and second the motion. Uh, board members, any other any any comments at all? No hands raised. Okay, so motion to approve the August thirtieth minutes, starting with Fred. I vote yes. Thank you, Fred. Jesse, I approve. Yes, Janet. I will abstain. Feeling more comfortable. Okay, Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So we have five members in favor, one abstention and one absence. All right, thank you all. The time now is 6.40 and we'll go to the second item on the agenda, which is public comment period. I typically read the names of public that I see in the, in the attendance list. So I'll do that now. And while I'm doing that, members of the public, if you uh, think you are gonna wanna speak for a general public comment, which will be limited to subjects which are not later on tonight's agenda, then please raise your hand at this time. So first person I see in roughly alphabetical order here, Amber Cano Martin. Andrew Shabbat, uh, Arthur Haskins, Bob Bezucha, Christopher Connolly, Corey M. from Pure Sky Energy, Eric Bachrock, Jacob Hirsch, Jenny Kalick, Lenore Brick, Lily Bruce, Lynn Bruning, Manjor Vahora, Maura Keen, Michael Lipinski, Renee Moss, Scott Cashin, Steve Loss, Tom Reedy, and WPC Teacher. Okay, so board uh, members of the public, do you have any comments on a of a general nature on things that are not related to tonight's agenda? Uh, during my reading of that list, I did not see any hands go up. I still see no hands raised. All right, going once, twice, and gone. So we will consider that there are no public comments tonight. Time now is 6.42.
and we'll move on to item three on the agenda. So um, this is a planning board review and a conversation about whether the planning board wants to make any recommendations to the ZBA of a project that will be under the jurisdiction of the ZBA, not the planning board. So this is ZBA FY 2023-18 from ASD Shootsbury Mass Solar LLC on Shootsbury Road, a request for a special permit under section 3.340 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 9.35 megawatt direct current, which is 4.4 megawatt alternating current ground mounted solar photovoltaic array spanning 41 acres on a 102 acre site with an accompanying battery storage energy system at three parcels of land owned by WD Coles Incorporated. Identified as map 9B, parcels 11 and 12 and map 9D, parcel 27 located on Shootsbury Road in the R RO zoning district. Frontage and access to the subject parcels of land is located between 187 and 201 Shootsbury Road. And the description and documents for this project can be located on the town of Amherst website. Um, I think, uh, let's see, it's www.amherstmass.gov slash 3741 slash Shootsbury Road Solar with hyphens between those three words. And the three words are each capitalized at the with the first letter. Okay, so welcome, Mr. Reedy. Um, is I think I saw in the attendees another member. Is yeah, Corey. we've got a few of them, Mr. Chair. So I'd say uh, yeah. Corey M. If Andrew C. is there, uh, and then Steve Loss um, is another one. And I think we've got a, a PowerPoint that we'll end up running through. And then Steve's the engineer on the project. He can answer any of the questions that you might have on a technical level. Okay, thank you. And uh, Chris, I know you wanted to make a brief introduction. Before Chris, before you do that, Mr. Reedy, who who was the other person? So, so it should be Corey M. and then Andrew C. if he's there. Andrew, Andrew Shabbat. Shabbat. Andrew that Shabbat. Shabbat, yeah. Um, and, and then Steve Loss, please. Okay. Shall I go ahead? Okay, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Right. So this project is being reviewed by the Zoning Board of Appeals under section 3.340.0 of the zoning bylaw, which is um, dealing with transformer stations or other energy facilities or use. The planning, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board have approved other um, projects under that um, part of the zoning bylaw. The ZBA is being asked to grant a special permit for this project. The ZBA public hearing opened in August and was continued to October 12th. The ZBA <clears throat> expects to hold several public hearing sessions about this project. And the zone ZBA will be considered considering what aspects of the project may require third party review, among many other things. The planning board is being asked to review the project and make comments and recommendations to the ZBA under section 10.323 of the zoning bylaw. The planning board can ask questions and make comments about the project and the planning board may make may take public comments at the discretion of the chair. This is not a public hearing, but a public meeting. And with agreement from the chair, we can now invite Tom Reedy and his team to present the project. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, Tom. You're Invitation on. accepted. Yeah. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of uh, ASD, Shootsbury Mass Solar LLC. I'm going to call them Pure Sky. Uh, they'll probably call themselves Pure Sky as well. It's a much simpler name. Uh, with me this evening, Andrew and Corey from Pure Sky. And then we've got Steve Loss um, and Chris Connolly as well from 
um, Vernon Terra, which is the, the engineering firm, the design firm for this. I think Chris gave a great background. You know, we're here to, to answer questions from the board. Um, hopefully you can make a recommendation for the Zoning Board of Appeals approval of this project. Uh, we have been in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals once back in August. Uh, we just had a site visit uh, this week with them and we're back in front of them next week. Um, you know, we expect this to be a process. And so, you know, we've, we've been fielding comments and questions from the different town departments, fire department, planning department, conservation department, et cetera, uh, compiling answers. Um, as far as conservation goes, there was a, what's called an, uh, order of resource area delineation, which essentially affixes where the resource areas are on the site that was originally issued. I want to say in uh, 2020, I think, uh, maybe September of 2020, uh, there is no tolling because of COVID. It's a three-year approval. And it also, on its own terms, required additional work to be done. Um, and so we are in the process of and have actually had uh, wetland scientists out um, looking at those resource area flags. Uh, we have found really no difference from that previous delineation, we are expect to submit that to the Conservation Commission, if not the end of this week, beginning of next week, and then that that's its own process. Uh, as you'll see in the plans, one of the things that we're doing, which you know this has been in conversations with Aaron in the Conservation Department, um, Pure Sky is staying outside of any buffer zones associated with resource areas. So they made the decision to say, okay, there's a, a bordering vegetated wetland that has the lines, there's a hundred foot buffer zone associated with that. They're staying outside of that 100 foot buffer zone to the resource area. So as a result, there, there won't be any conservation commission notice of intent required because they are staying uh, more than a sufficient distance away. Um, just one of the things to note as you're kind of paying attention this evening, but those are the other processes that we're currently moving through. And then obviously we're here in front of you tonight. And so I think what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Andrew to walk you through just a little bit about Pure Sky, who they are, um, maybe solar a little bit generally, what they're and then what they're looking to do on the site. By all means, stop us, ask us questions during. Um, if you want to wait till after, if you have more questions, you know, Pure Sky is really knowledgeable. Uh, we've been through one round with the ZBA and like I said, town departments already. So uh, we've been, they've been thinking about it. They continue to think about it. So um, feel free to ask. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Great, thank you very much, Tom. I am just going to share my screen really quickly. So just bear with me one second. Um, so I'm assuming everyone can see, see my screen now? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thanks to Tom for the introduction, uh, just to kind of, you know, talk about um, Pure Sky a little bit. And my name is Andrew Chabot, Development uh, Director at Pure Sky, joined by Core Mechanicalis uh, Development Associate. Um, we're happy to be here. So thanks for everybody's time tonight. Um, really uh, appreciate giving the chance to you know, talk a little bit more about the project. Um, just gonna progress over here. So um, to talk a little bit about Pure Sky, we are a community solar developer. So we'll be looking to develop and construct solar and typically energy storage uh, projects to provide clean energy to the electric grid. Uh, we're actually already active in Amherst. We're working on the Hickory Ridge project site now uh, and working closely with town officials there. So we're already active in the town and hoping to uh, be able to move forward with another project uh, within Amherst as well. Um, for our projects, we typically will see um, our off-takers be, you know, ranging from towns themselves to small businesses, housing authorities, individuals. Um, so we're uh, excited about this project and um, really looking forward to answering any questions you have. I'm just gonna go through a few slides and go through quickly, but then um, I'm hoping to leave plenty of time at the end for, for questions. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, Andrew, is an off taker like a recipient? Yes, exactly. So it's, it's somebody who will be using the electricity. Thank you. Yes. Um, we are supported by WD Coles. They are um, uh, given us this opportunity, you know, in addition to um, them conserving as working forests several thousand acres of, uh, of land, they've set aside certain properties that they can also pursue 
as solar development to further their environmental stewardship uh, in line with the kind of their generational business approach. So um, we wouldn't be here without them today. So this is one of their properties that, you know, is, um, you know, perfectly suited for us to be able to connect to the electric grid for where it's located. Um, to kind of further what Tom was mentioning, here's a kind of quick overview of the progress uh, to date from where we are today. I'm not going to go through every one of these lines, but just to kind of illustrate that we started this process in uh, mid-2020, uh, engaged with various town officials, had several Zoom calls with the Butters, as, uh, the Butter site walk on site, then went to the Conservation Commission to discuss the project. And it was in those those initial meetings which were really helpful. We did learn that you know, uh, there was some additional work that needed to be done in terms of some studies. So we uh, went through the application to be able to have a sufficient time to do those studies, which did also result in a project redesign where, as Tom mentioned, we are you know, moving completely out of the wetland buffer zone. We kind of, instead of using the existing logging road, kind of are moving into the sides. So we're staying out of buffer zones entirely. Uh, which did result in the project decreasing somewhat, but we're happy to do it for a better project. Uh, continuing on, we you know, did additional work, uh, did some site, more site walks. We uh, had a pre-application meeting with the town, um, did a water quality report on the local drinking well water in the area. And then in submission, submitting our application to the uh, planning department, you know, there were some additional studies that were requested we, we carry out, which we did. And uh, then, Submitted our application and was deemed complete in June of this year. And um, going through that initial ZBA meeting is what brings us here to see you all today. Um, so to take kind of a step back from that, why we're pursuing this work at all. Um, one of the little known facts is that on the electric grid, about half of the energy we use today is fired by natural gas on average. Uh, that's using ISO New England data uh, for the general region. And when you look at Massachusetts, it's about closer to 80%. Um, the state has set a goal of reaching 40% renewable energy by the year 2030, and we're currently at 12%. So um, with the time provided, we're very much hoping that this project could um, be uh, given the approval so we could help the state meet those goals and transition away from that natural gas generation. Um, some of the benefits of a project like this is that in addition to um, you know, providing that clean energy, over the 35 to 40 year expected lifetime. Um, there is carbon sequestration um, benefit there that you receive from not having to get electricity from a fossil fuel source like natural gas. So the equivalent of that using EPA calculators uh, shows that it would be the equivalent carbon sequestration as if you had planted 51 or 100 acres or so of forest for locking in that carbon from the carbon you're avoiding from that fossil fuel facility. Uh, in addition, the energy that this will generate will power about 1,500 Massachusetts homes on average annually. So I uh, think this could be a really strong project for the community. And one of the things we're looking to move forward with on the project itself is that uh, we're going to be having a, a pollinator meadow underneath that array um, that won't use herbicide at all. It will be um, using native vegetation to help support uh, species that are at greatest conservation risk in the state. Um, these are typically, um, you know, areas that, you know, can be very minimally maintained due to their native vegetation, you know, uh, behavior and kind of the, the nature of that. So we usually only have to get out there maybe once a year to trim back some vegetation that might be shading some panels, uh, just to make sure that the efficiency is, is still up and, and going. And not to mention, I mean, these typically look much better with, uh, than what you might see in other facilities that just sort of leave the, the ground bare. So we're, we're hoping that can provide additional ecological benefit uh, in addition to the clean energy that the project will, will generate. Uh, the town specifically will receive tax payments from the facility without having to, you know, this facility be a burden on the town and it won't be taking, you know, water resources or, you know, sending anybody to use, um, you know, the town resources in any way. It's going to uh, provide that clean energy I, I mentioned onto the grid and some uh, local ecosystem diversity. Uh, in addition, we're looking to try to make this a uh, optimal opportunity for a research partnership to uh, be able to study long-term effects of a facility such as this, while also um, giving giving the, the 
the land some some uh, relief of, of the soil fatigue it's experiencing. Um, to speak specifically about the project, uh, here's a high level image of the proposed project now. What you see in front of you is the project parcel. It's actually three parcels together and the array uh, situated on top of that with those gray lines, those are the array. If you can see my, my mouse, the way it were, it's uh, laid out is this is the access road coming in from the west using this existing logging road that's already there, coming down and then hitting the first basin for stormwater features right where I'm hovering now. Then this kind of gray line moving diagonally is vegetative screening that is set up to provide, in addition to the, the um, forest that will be left intact in this green area um, to the, the north and west of that, um, be able to provide you know, additional screening for any abutters so that no one will have to see the facility in the, in the woods there. Um, the access road then continues, and this is where we pushed it out of that existing footprint where it was originally within the wetland buffer, looping down the south where you hit the second stormwater basin before then going to the east, which is where the equipment pad will sit, which is where the energy storage, power electronics, the inverter will, will live, and then will continue on until uh, it turns into this com compressed, uh, more footpath type, uh, type um, uh, access point to get to that basin three over there. Um, one thing I will note is that from some preliminary feedback since our initial submission, there will be a few things that we're aiming to just tweak uh, based on feedback from the fire department. One is a turnaround area that will be before the equipment pad, um, probably about where I'm hovering right now, but I, uh, I don't wanna get told no by, by uh, Steve and Chris, but that's kind of where we're working on right now to, to fine tune that. And then most likely, uh, instead of cutting this area where I'm hovering, leave that area um, uh, as vegetation so it can provide connectivity between the wetland and this other wetland here. So we're actually making some of these, these further tweaks based on that feedback. And um, this facility, the sizing is about, you know, 9.35 megawatts DC, which is the equivalent of powering up 1500 homes, as I mentioned earlier, on a footprint of about 41 acres or so of, um, of land. So uh, one of the things that's common and which will be provided for this facility is a decommissioning agreement and bond so that at the end of its useful life, it will be able to be removed entirely, uh, that's standard, um, and uh, something that's a good protection just to, to have. Um, with that, I am going to um, pause and turn it over to Corey to speak a little bit more about some more of uh, the project details. So uh, Corey, just let me know when you want me to uh, progress the slides here. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, thank you again so much for having us tonight. And thank you, Andrew, for the introduction um, to the project. Uh, so we, so Andrew had mentioned, you know, site design considerations. And one thing that we do consider is um, distance to nearby abutters and folks living in somewhat close proximity to the site. Um, I believe some of what, you know, some of those folks may are in the meeting tonight. Um, but we wanted to showcase, uh, you know, these are quite far away from um, everybody's property along Shootsbury Road. Um, and I do apologize, I can't see any faces because the PowerPoint screen is taking up most of the room on the screen here. Um, but if anybody has any questions as I go along, please hit the question, um, raise hand button down at the bottom. Um, that way I'll see your question pop up and I can um, ad address it. But yeah, so we just wanted, we, we wanted to insert this slide on, you know, how close is this um, array to uh, folks nearby along Shootsbury Road. Um, one quick question before we talk about this is, is everybody on the board familiar where this property is? It's located along Shootsbury Road and then um, where that elbow, where the road uh, goes to the northeast, um, there is a, an existing logging road from Coles and it goes into the into the back of the site. So just hoping, I just want to make sure that everybody knows the general area of, of where we're talking about. 
Um, yeah, Corey, I think it's safe to, to assume we all are familiar with the general area. We may not be intimately familiar with that, with Shutesbury Road, but we, we know where it is in town and roughly how to get there. Okay, great. Um, excellent. Yeah, so it is off of Shrewsbury Road, um, and we are going to take advantage of Cole's um, existing uh, logging road as the primary access road. Um, the distance from the closest abutters property line to our limit of disturbance, and here we define the limit of disturbance as the project boundaries. So where any sort of grading or equipment would be installed, um, you know, anything beyond the fence line. And for here, it's just where that, that where Andrew had pointed out where that line of vegetation is. Um, Andrew, if you could hover over there. Yeah, so um, that is an example of what is the limit of disturbance. Um, so the closest one is over 200 feet from the, uh, from the closest neighbor. Um, from there, from a home, from any, you know, an abutter's home is about 245 feet. Um, and then from the, you know, from the edge of the solar panels to like the closest neighbor's property line is, um, you know, 274 feet. And then um, to the equipment pad is um, from the property line to our equipment pad is over 800 feet. So we did want to take this into consideration and try and move everything as far back into the site as we could. Um, uh, below here, we did see some vegetative screening details. Um, we originally proposed arborvitae. We did get some feedback from the ZBA last month that they would prefer something more um, native to the area. So we will be changing that to holly. Um, and yeah, so we, and if you look on the, on the screen here, those green squares i believe those are the homes is that right steve and this is steve floss he's the head engineer with um bird and Terra. and steve and chris Connolly. they've been helping us with um, all the site plan and engineering work um, yes the so. green the green uh objects are the homes on those properties are um, estimated off aerial imagery all right um i do see a hand from a board member <clears throat> do you want to go through the rest of your presentation or do you want to have us stop you as you go on? Um, we can go ahead and answer questions as we as we okay. go along. We just right, we want so, to be respectful of the time. Okay, Corey, then Janet, you have a question. Thank you. Are you going to stay with the entrance off of Shootsbury Road? Because I had heard there was an inter in this at the entrance is an intermittent stream. And so is the CONCOM going to move your road or are you going to make adjustments based on that? Corey, if you don't mind. Um, so there's been no determination by the Conservation Commission yet, uh, Janet, as to any uh, resource area at the roadway. If you've been up there, you see that uh, there's a culvert under the Coles access driveway, which collects water from Shootsbury Road, right? So it's all that sheet flow that's coming down, falling into uh, some like a riprap swale, getting culverted under that existing access driveway and continuing to head down gradient. So um, it has not been categorized as a wetland at this point. Uh, if it is, there's an existing access road there currently. And so we would, for that piece of the project, if it is determined to be a resource area, uh, and we're keeping the road where it is because there's an existing access driveway, we would have to go through uh, the Conservation Commission in a notice of intent for that limited area of access. So just, I wanna be careful about the classification of it as an intermittent stream, um, which hasn't been done yet. And if it is, then, you know, I. It's not like it's in the middle of a field and you've got running water all the time. It literally is a drainage structure that takes sheet flow off of Shootsbury Road. But okay. this, so this is the proposed access. So okay. that hasn't been delineated yet or determined by the Conservation Commission. So that was uh, our wetland scientists didn't think it was uh, a resource area. Um, and a butter thought that it might have been and had it delineated, but 
as to our understanding, there has been no formal delineation of that resource area on the abutters property, which would impact this project. Okay. That's a complicated answer, but I think I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Corey, why don't you go ahead? Okay, great. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, Andrew. Okay, great. So, um, so there, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about this slide in which we're, we're happy to answer. Um, it is a fairly large project, uh, you know, in speaking with the staff, um, primarily the ZBA staff, we've been uh, told that this is one of the largest, largest projects that has been, you know, has gone across their desks um, in the town of Amherst. So, you know, we, we understand the, um, you know, the scrutiny that it's come under and, and we, we welcome it. We want to make sure that we have a really great site plan and project. So, um, so what, what we have uh, supplied to the ZBA and the staff has been um, a phasing plan, and that includes uh, the construction of the site. And so all sort of site preparation, site construction, equipment installation, um, that has all been addressed in this phasing plan. Um, it is a large site at a little over 41 acres. It is treed. Um, those trees, you know, they will come down, uh, but they. We want to make sure that we're doing it responsibly, and if it were up to us, we wouldn't clear any trees. Um, however, we just are. We're we're stuck with very high criteria of siting and where we can and cannot develop projects. Um, part of that is the smart rules and regulations, which are issued by the DOER with the state. Part of it is also, um, you know, with the infrastructure from National Grid and Eversource, uh, you know, where we can go to find power lines that we that will allow for us to hook up, you know, projects like this to the grid and start, you know, passing on um, generating electricity to the grid. So um, it, it is a large site and it will require tree clearing. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing this as responsibly as possible. Part of that will include um, the spacing plan. And so uh, we, we have designed it um, per all state and town of Amherst rules and regulations. Um, our first pass at it has uh, been reviewed by the CONCOM and we have received comments back um, in the form of a transmittal. Um, it was a very lengthy uh, transmittal with a lot of different comments and a lot of really great ideas. And so we have been working with um, staff to, and and Erin um, Jake with the CONCOM. I'm not sure if she's on tonight, but we've been working with her to, um, you know, to amend parts of the of the plan that we had uh, sent in back and reviewed back in August. <clears throat> and so we just want to make it very clear what it includes and so um we are not we are not saying proposing that you know go out and clear 41 acres in one fell swoop uh we want to do this responsibly so we're going through it in a, a 10 acre increments um it will include erosion and sediment control measures um and perimeter measures to make sure that um, you know, nothing, once the trees are cleared, they, and also they will not be stumped and nothing will be grubbed or um, the low-lying vegetation won't be removed unless it is for ESC and perimeter controls. Um, but those stumps will be staying in the ground and the, the trees will be cleared in acres of 10, uh, excuse me, in increments of 10 acres. And um, they will also be identified uh, the workspace will be identified before we go in, um, and that is to make sure that, you know, we have the 10 acres outlined and delineated as well as all of the natural resources. So you will see that there are several wetlands that we will be going around. Um, and so we want to make sure that those wetland areas are identified, the buffer zones are identified, um, and then the limits of disturbance are identified. So we don't inadvertently, um, you know, have any sort of uh, washout or anything impacting those uh, very sensitive natural resource areas. So, um, yeah, so Corey, just, just to uh, 
just yeah. to add, I think that it's important to note that the way we kind of characterize the the way the project will kind of move forward is I lump it into three phases for you know conceptual ease. One is what Corey just mentioned, the kind of pre-construction phase, which helps to remove the trees and kind of lay them down to be there and selectively removed in, in those phases that are you know usually 10 acres or less at a time. Then moving on to um, the kind of the A phase, which is as you can see on the, the screen here, moving um, from you know phase one, which is you know doing the stumping and grubbing, stabilization, getting confirmation from the town that that's occurred and that's totally fine. And then once that's approved, moving on to the next phase. And then going through, you know, phase two, three, four, five. And then, you know, as we're kind of going through the site, once we get to maybe phase three during the A phase, kind of following behind with the B phase where we actually start to do actual project construction, where we're, you know, doing some, some um, putting some of the piles into the ground, the modules and such. So that's kind of how we, how it's planned out since uh, from the collaboration with, we've kind of had with um, ConCon to date. So. I just wanted to quickly add that. So, Corey, you want me to go to the next slide? I think we're here. Sure. Yeah. Unless Doug, um, do you see any raised hands? Otherwise, we can keep moving I, on. I do not. I, I guess I have a question that I can ask now or later, um, and that is if you're. I guess the the benefit that you're assuming comes from phasing is that you do a section of removal and site preparation, and then you pause long enough to see whether that act has detrimental effects downstream, or are you pausing long enough to uh, let new plant growth establish itself so that the runoff is minimized? Or what is, what is the purpose of phasing if there's not a pause in between to take stock? No, that's, that's a great question. I can take first whack at it and then I might turn it over to Steve and Chris to provide maybe more of the technical details. But um, as you described, it's it's the benefit is to, um, so you're not doing the entire site all at one time, you're doing it in more manageable chunks, making sure that that area is stabilized before moving on to the next area. And it's more manageable to make sure that, you know, you don't have to deal with any sort of site-wide issues at the same time time you can focus on this 10 acre or less um, area make sure it's established make sure vegetation has started to take hold and then that provides uh, pretty strong stormwater mitigation um, uh, and erosion control and then once that's confirmed by the town then moving on to the next area with an understanding that that prior phase is most likely um, pr fairly safe and won't be uh, won't be experiencing any erosion with continual checks along the way throughout the project process. And so how how long is a like how many weeks or months between phases? Yeah, so each phase and I um our a rule of thumb is for the A phase, it's you know can range but it's between you know 10 and 30 days for each phase to kind of be completion. And it does you know vary because it's it's quite literally watching the grass grow on site. And so um, it can be a little faster. It could be you know, towards 30 days and then it's verified and then we kind of move on. For the construction phase, each phase is a little quicker. It's a little bit more in control. Um, and that's usually around like 10 to 20 days, uh, working days, each um, each phase. And, and Doug, it's also important to keep in mind that we have um, a lot of temporary erosion and sediment control measures that we can implement. Um, it's just a fancy way of saying, you know, we can use straw bales, silt fences, wood chips. So a lot of those trees that we're clearing will will chip um, a lot of them, and we'll use those on the same site to as as a temporary means of making sure that the soil stays where it, it needs to. Okay, thank you. So I do see one other hand. Uh, Janet, you have a question? You know, I did, I actually have another question because I'm not, I, I'm sort of along Doug's line. Um, so you have five phases there and it's about a month for cutting down the trees in phase one, putting up, you know, putting up your straw bales and everything like that. And then planting grass, waiting till it grows. And then you cut down another 10 acres and do that over like, and that takes a month each phase. Is that what you just said? 
So the way that will work is the, the tree removal is actually in the pre-construction phase. So, so what will happen is the trees will be cut down and, and laid and the stumps will, and all the you know grubs will just remain in place. And then as we're going through, then we kind of go to phase A where you know then stumps are removed, grubbing happens. And so if you can see what we've listed under here, uh, phases 1A to 5A, that's sort of when that stump removal will occur and the stabilization of each process of each phase okay. will happen. Okay, so you're going to cut all the trees down and then start, that's pre-construction phase, not phase one, but that's a phase. And then you start grubbing, which is pulling out all the, the roots of the trees and chipping them. And, and when you're doing that is when you put the barriers in the silt fences, do you do that after you cut the trees? So when we are um, cutting the trees, we will first cut the trees and then uh, we'll go through and install the temporary erosion and sediment control features. Yes. One of that is, is also installing all perimeter controls. So that'll be the first thing that's done before getting to stumping and grubbing. Okay, so I say assume per perimeter controls is another word for fence, but I might be wrong. Okay. And so the, the question, I, I sort of get that. Um, the question I was going to ask you, if you can go back to the um, thing is, can you tell me how water moves across this site? Because I see a lot of wetlands, there's in, intermittent streams and, you know, bordering vegetative wetlands, there's two streams or brooks. And so like, where does water go? Where does it start? And where does it go? If you can just do a general, just, you know, I also see different slopes. Sure. I think that's a perfect answer for Steve or Chris, if you want to maybe talk about the water flow. I know the, the land generally slopes from northwest down to southeast, but um, there are some variations in wetlands that will remain on site. So um, I'll just let uh, one of you take that. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe the cursor, that little thing. Yeah, this is Steve. Um, it's hard, hard to see under the panels, I'm going to be looking at my CAD on my computer to uh, to give you that answer. Steve, so, do you um, want me to unshare so you can share your screen? Um, I, I don't know that we'll have to. Let, let me uh, just get my contours on here. <clears throat> opening up a CAD file here and now. Yeah, I, while we're waiting for Steve to get that open, um, I think the only stream where the water is moving is that um, cold Adams Brook to the, to the uh, east of our site, Andrew. And then the rest of the wetlands are... Um, Th those are th those are not streams or cr or creeks. Um, they they won't be flowing into any other um, tributaries or anything like that. It, it's really just that cold Adams Brook that is flowing to the east, and we are maintaining a two hundred foot buffer from there. Uh, Corey, do you mean uh, where where on the uh, plan that we're looking at is the brook? So where yes. I'm sitting now is to the east is this. Okay, uh, so it's off the property yeah. on off to the east. Right, yes. and what Corey is referring to is that you know, the, this little kind of indentation here, this you can kind of see a little kind of indent, that's the 200 foot boundary of the setback from, from that rock. So I think to answer Janet's question is the other wetlands, um, they they won't be flowing into any other <clears throat> wetland areas um, and for rainfall that is hitting the rest of the site um, any sort of you know any sort of rainfall that we have um, is already accounted and designed for with um, and you know stormwater measurement <clears throat> features and erosion and sediment control features that Steve and Chris have um, that they that they have baked into their site plans and designed for so. Um, Steve, do you happen to have that pulled up? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to, to discuss here. Thank um, you. Sure. <clears throat> so looking, starting from the top phase to the light cyan, um, these contours are all coming, you know, water's coming from the north, um, sheet flowing toward you know, your wetlands and streams are going to be your low areas, obviously. So Dave, before we go any further, which direction is north on this plan? Up, directly up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so your water's coming down into this centrally located um, wetland area, which, you know, all the white area there around it is, is undisturbed. I, I um, can't, oh, I can, I can barely see that, but is there a way to focus just on the map and not the text? Okay, we got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so to the west of the wetland area, all that area is coming down um, and toward this, this stream over here. Okay, just um, a minute. Um, Steve, sure. we cannot see any anything on your screen. We can't see any, there's no arrow. And person. Andrew, if you can follow, if you're able to move your cursor according to what Steve is saying, great. Otherwise, maybe we need to switch whose right. screen sure. we're seeing. Yeah, I think yeah, Steve is probably maybe, most effective uh, of I yeah, I've requested control. I didn't realize I didn't I okay. didn't have that. So Thanks, are you able to see my cursor move now? No, not yet. This, hmm. We're still seeing Andrew's screen. Yeah, yeah so so am I, but I, it should oh, there be he my goes. Yep. No. Nope. Okay. So I I'm not moving my cursor. That's that's you, Steve. <laughs> okay, that's... good. All right, that's I'm sure that'll be better for everyone. Um, so yes, coming down from the north, these the drainage is coming right into this this central area here. Um, as you come over here, some of this is going there, and the rest of it is going to come down. Everything's pretty straight down. So there's a wetland and then the stream off site here. This area coming down in this direction, down toward this corner. That's why. These orange areas are going to be basins, so um, you'll see the water is coming down toward that section. Um, as you come over here, it's kind of a ridge that comes through here, so you'll have some of this area going up to the northeast toward this wetland area, uh, kind of a ridge that kind of, maybe kind of comes through here. The rest of this comes down. You can see this stream here, and you kind of see a little bit of a draw as it comes down here and then over um, another basin that we're proposing right here. So, and the rest of this side, um, you know, from the ridge, like I said, some's going up, up this direction, but most of it from here is going to come down straight across all this topography and down towards your stream over here. Um, which way did I go there? Okay. And the rest of this down south um, is, is coming just in a southern direction and a, a little bit, a bit of a ridge here kicking over toward the stream and wetland over here and the other side pretty much going down, down this way in the southeast toward everything obviously getting over to the stream over here. Adams. All right. Thank you, Steve. Sure. All right. So Andrew and Corey, maybe you can give the cursor back to one of you and Great. continue with your slides. Hey, right, thank you. Uh, so I can go to the next slide now. So uh, oh, but, and, and Andrew, yes. before you go further, um, I guess I was just going to say that this slide, uh, the way you've structured the, the, the way we're talking about this, mm -hmm. it feels a little bit confusing because you've got multiple uses of the word phase. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a pre-construction phase and then you've got a phase A. Well, maybe it's step A during phase one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think you might want to refine that for later meetings. That's helpful. Thank you. We can certainly do that. Um, and so just to continue on, uh, we have this uh, an, an proposed energy storage of the Powen Centipede modular stack. Um, that is uh, effectively uh, the energy storage that we were looking to use on site. 
Um, that will be uh, located on the equipment pad. It is unlike some of the containerized solutions you've seen. It's a little bit more um, easier to get more granular with, with this product uh, because this smart program requires us to have storage paired with uh, solar facilities. This is um, one of the ones that has been uh, selectively used on other sites, uh, very reliable. And um, we are working closely with the fire department uh, just to make sure that they have everything they need to make sure that they can um, respond if there's ever a need to go on site, which is um, not expected uh, for the for the facility and uh, one of the transmittals we received as well. Um, moving on to the actual construction phase, and I want to just kind of conclude this so we can get more to the, the questions side. Um, the construction, you know, optimistically assuming that there's a, a permit granted at the end of this year, uh, we're aiming to go through um, a process that will take many months to get through until we get to construction up until mechanical completion. So at the earliest, at the very earliest, uh, we wouldn't expect to do any sort of construction on the, the site until, um, you know, seven or eight, even eight months after a permit is granted uh, because we have to work to get through procurement, make sure we do final um, issued for construction permit designs based on these final approved designs and then go through the process of doing the civil work on site, mechanical work and electrical until we do reach that uh, mechanical completion event. Um, we would make sure that, you know, per this entire process that, you know, there are this constant monitoring, making sure that in any sort of rain event, there'd be someone going out there uh, to check on the site to make sure there's been no erosion at all uh, to, and correct that if there is any that's starting to be seen. Um, and as well to just, uh, you know, provide, uh, you know, uh, progress on, on site. Uh, the long-term operations and maintenance of the project is pretty minimal. It's a facility that basically just sits there fairly inert. And it's really only once a year we have to have somebody come on site to uh, look at the site, you know, make sure that the vegetation isn't overgrowing any of the panels, making sure that the stormwater features are uh, clear, there's nothing that's in there. Um, and then just making sure that the actual pollinator meadow is still flourishing as we hope it will, will do. Um, the stormwater features is pretty, you know, probably the primary reason we get out there just to check on those, um, uh, along with the vegetation management. Um, so with that, that concludes our presentation went a little longer than I promised, but we'd love to answer any of your questions so I can, um, yeah, pause there. Um, I guess, Johanna, go ahead. I've got a question and I'll follow you. Sounds good. Thanks, Doug. Um, you answered a lot of my questions about native habitat. I have, I guess, here, here are my questions. Um, have you considered fencing that allows for some habitat continuity for some species? Number two, are there any economies of scale that can be won on the Hickory Ridge project as this moves forward? And what would that mean for Amherst residents? And then I know that there are interconnection delays in terms of integrating onto the grid, even in preferred areas. So I was hoping you could give a little bit of an update on that. And then my last question is, why do you call it natural gas when it's, uh, you know, mostly methane? <laughs> <laughs> no, great questions. I, I will um, tick through those and, and Corey, please let me know if I'm off with anything. Um, so um, starting in reverse, you're right. I mean, it, it is methane, it's not natural gas. It's, you know, we, the common parlance is natural gas, but yes, it's just from the ground, we burn it. It's uh, even in these facilities that burn it, it's less than 50% efficient most times. So half of that gas is actually just burned for no reason uh, and, and for the electrons that it generates. And then you have the carbon that's offset from there. So that um, more accurately, it is methane, that is correct. Um, to speak to the interconnection delays, um, again, spot on, one of the biggest problems we're facing in the state right now is that the, uh, the electric grid is almost completely congested. And the state is actually proactively um, trying to address this now. It's required through legislation that 
the Department of Public Utilities re review and approve submissions put forward by the investor owned utilities, Nat um, National Grid and Eversource for statewide electrical system upgrades, which will be billions of dollars. Um, it's uh, actually what my wife works on. So we've, we're pretty boring dinner guests because it's all we talk about is energy. Um, but um, keep each other company, I guess. So, um, but that is not expected to really have any sort of relief for the grid until at the earliest 2028, when they start to upgrade existing substations before they start building new substations to free up more opportunity for land. So with this project, we've actually already gone through the study with Eversource. We've gotten our interconnection service agreement, which is required. We've made some of those initial payments. And um, from Eversource's point of view, we are essentially good to go. And they're ready to upgrade the associated uh, feeder line for the project and the substation to allow us to interconnect. So that is ongoing. Um, getting to the Hickory Ridge question. Um, yes, so that project is actually looking to hopefully begin construction in the coming months. And the way it's set up is that the procurement is a little offset for when we would hope to procure for this project. So right now, um, there, there may be some economies of scale for um, you know, energy generated, but for actual construction, it's a little misaligned, which is, which is too bad. Otherwise, we definitely would have leaned into that to try to, to um, see what we could do to pass that some benefits on to the, the local community there. Um, and then uh, the last question about fencing. Um, yeah, so I neglected to mention, I'm sorry, is that the fencing across the entirety of the site will have a six or so inch gap underneath to allow um, for, uh, you know, small animals to be able to, to traverse through the site, uh, to allow them to kind of move throughout the site, out of the site. It'll be grassland, so there'll be, I think, plenty of things of food and interest for them in there and allow them to kind of get between different wetlands and such and uh, forested areas. Okay, thank you, Andrew, and thanks, Johanna, for those questions. I had one question, and then uh, we'll go to Jesse. Um, when I look at the site plan, I'm a little bit surprised that the access road for the fire department stops what looks like about two thirds the way down toward the southeast. And um, if I were the fire department, should I? I guess I wonder why I don't have access all the way down to your lower uh, right-hand corner and whether I, whether that is really okay not to have that. That's that's a, a good one. Um, that effectively, if and I, I certainly won't try to speak for the fire department, but yeah. my understanding of what the fire department cares about is really what's on that equipment pad. Um, and so what's on that equipment pad are some of the power electronics that really are where the fire risk lay. Um, there's also the energy storage there, which is also you know a primary concern, just to make sure that is uh, they're able to reach that. One of the pieces of feedback that we have received from from them is to uh, you know make sure that there's a turnaround uh, area for that for a truck if it needs to you know get there um, you know and not pass by the equipment pad uh, if there's anything going on that, on that pad. So it will actually be before the equipment pad that it's not present here because they're still making some of those you know. Uh, updates, but it will be somewhere where the, the truck can turn around before getting to that pad. Okay, and yeah. one, and you one of, sorry, Doug, I just wanted to uh, also make it clear that um, they have seen this plan as is, and um, we have, that was that, and um, adding access uh, for around the array for pedestrian access um, for for the fire department or emergency response services. Um, so there, there will be gates where they can get in and out um, around the rest of the array, um, but they have seen this pl the, these plans and that wasn't one of the things that they had asked for was okay. to extend the road. And you will not need a maintenance roadway, for instance, you'll just go between rows of panels? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll go to Jesse next. Thanks. So, um, perhaps this came up with the Conservation Commission. I'm just wondering, do you have projects of similar size you can point to that have sort of wetlands surrounded almost entirely that you know the before and after that they're still thriving with this kind of layout? Sure. I um, there, We have projects that have been 
next to wetlands. Um, I, I think that, you know, in terms of uh, stormwater flow, that's the, the primary concern when it comes to wetlands and erosion. Um, I think Steve or Chris, if you want to talk specifically about, you know, anything regarding that and kind of the protections in place to make sure that uh, wetlands are not encroached upon, making sure that there's no erosion to wetlands. I think that would be a pretty um, good thing to dive into a little deeply because that's certainly a, a primary area we're um, working uh, with and trying to um, to make better every day. With this yeah, I guess, sorry, if I can just add to that. I guess I'm thinking more of like, okay, two years after it's built, are there still as many species there that were there before? Has that been studied at all? Is that a, is that a factor you think about? Oh, for a species on the site. I mean, uh, our hope is that in uh, transitioning this this land to this pollinator meadow we're hoping for, it will actually create more diversity for for different plants and animals to thrive in this area that the this region doesn't have. The entirety of the surrounding area, if you look at, uh, I don't have to tell you this, uh, Google Maps is all wooded. So there will be well, all the species that are there here on the site will you know, just still be there, just kind of outside, you know, this kind of immediate area, some within, I'm sure. And then uh, the idea is that this will have that benefit of some uh, diversity for that, that ecosystem for, for grassland, much like it was in Massachusetts um, a couple hundred years ago. This was all farmland, for example. Yeah, Andrew, I think that there, oh, uh, so, sorry, Andrew, I think there's actually a slide further down um, showcasing the, um, threatened and endangered birds that have um, similar sort of habitat, that have habitat similar to the kind that we're proposing to plant. Is this what you have in mind, Corey? Yeah. So I'm not saying that these are the birds that will move in. Um, and I don't know that we have studied um, the consequences of bird, if species settling in on any of our other projects, but we are create, you know, we are creating a habitat where they, you know, similar to the ones where birds like this would thrive. Okay. Um, Shannon, it looks like you're next. Janet, you are muted. I have actually have so many questions. I think Jesse's question was, um, does the wetland operate as well after as it did before? Do you go back and say, oh, you know, we, we, we put all these panels near the wetland. There's a big buffer zone. There's still as many animals and plants that were there before. Not, you know, we understand that grassland would have different species than forest land. So I think that that was his question. But so my question is, um, or my questions is, this is, you know, I've been working on the solar bylaw, the draft solar bylaw, and this area, part of the, the your your lot has a local rare species habitat for a locally rare species. Um, it's also a core habitat and critical habitat under the state um, the state's designations, and so in our current version of the draft bylaw, you couldn't put a solar, you couldn't put a solar array there because of the importance of this land. Um, and so I, you know, one of my recommendations is to do a plant and wildlife study of what's there to make sure we're not hurting something that, you know, is threatened or rare or the importance, seeing the importance of that, um, to, like what's there. Cause it's not just five acres, it's 40 acres. And, you know, it's a much bigger site. And so that I think is an important, my recommendation to the ZBA would be to hire someone to do that kind of assessment. And you clearly have time because of all the um, issues and delays and you know all the, the length of this thing. Um, I know that a lot of the people, all the people around you are on private wells and they have come to our solar bylaw working group for almost more than a year now. They're kind of our loyal, loyal attendees and they're very concerned about potential app impacts to the private wells because they're on well water and if that disappears, it goes away. And so I'd be really interested in hearing more. When I ask that question, like, where does the water go? You know, when I look at this site, I see a complicated system of water and wetlands and trees, and I don't know what's happening underground and what's feeding their wells. Um, and so I think that would be a question for me is just someone understanding the water resource area, where does groundwater go? Um, and then the other, so that's an issue. 
we have um, our Amherst Water Supply Protection Committee has a white paper about solar bylaws and their impacts. And they have a whole series of recommendations um, for ways to protect water sources um, and doing test pits and all sorts of things. And I, I wonder if you've looked at that and could take on the additional requirements and the, the sort of testing that they're seeing when you're dealing with water resources that affect water supply. That's kind of a, um, and then it's kind of like a, the things I'm worrying about. Um, specifically in terms of questions, I was I have very specific um, questions about, do you have an idea of how many trees you think you'll be cutting down? And also, um, how close is the battery storage facility to trees? Because I think we're recommending 100 feet from trees. And um, we know the battery storage, we know, I mean, either you don't know, but if you read the paper, batteries, lithium ion batteries are very volatile. It's part of my husband's business. Um, they are very volatile and they go on fire. And I know there's it's kind of a learning and manufacturers are working on how to contain those fires. But the recommendation I think from the fire department from our committee is gonna be at least a hundred feet from trees, you know, because of wind and things like that. And so do you have an idea of how many trees will be cut and then how far is the battery system from trees? And is there actually a way of locating the battery system more inside the panels? So it's really near nothing. So, uh uh, one thing I, I will mention is that there has been a natural resource inventory study done on the habitat for for the site. It has been included with the ZBA packet, and those materials are available. Uh, as well as for the drinking well um, factor, we've also in engaged with a hydrologist to do a, a study that found that there would be no impact to drinking wells in the area, which is also uh, available uh, to the ZBA. Um, for the... Um, tree count, uh, I know it's 41 acres. I don't know that we've done a count of every tree on the site. Um, and uh, for the distance from the limit of disturbance for the batteries, I'll turn that over to Steve, uh, if you want to give more of an exact measurement of where that's kind of sits. Before you go on, I'm not exactly asking how many trees, but do you, I mean, you must have some sense of how many will be cut. How many trees on site? All cut? parts, you know, figure. I no? apologize. I, I couldn't venture a guess. I wouldn't want to okay. steer Sorry. you wrong. Okay. We, we are partnering with the timbering company, so we can easily get you those answers mm -hmm. or at least a general estimate. Mm -hmm. And what was the distance you're looking for from the, from the battery area to what? To trees. Um, not the pad, but the the mechanicals, the batteries themselves. Well, I don't have um, the exact battery locations on my drawing, but the, the edge of the the bottom edge of the pad is 110 feet from, but will be 110 feet from a tree line. Okay, good. All right. Thank you, Janet. And now we'll go to Karen. Karen, we can you speak up or, or we can't hear you? Now you're muted. You were not muted before. Try it again. Unmute again. Now speak. Okay. Ah. Uh. You, you, you're muted now. Click it one more time and then try again to speak. No, it, you're not coming through. No. No. Um, yeah, we can't hear you. Has something changed with your machine and, and or the speaker? Did you inadvertently uh mute the microphone on the laptop or something you are you are muted from our point of view maybe she could call in maybe yeah no we're not hearing you
okay. Um, <clears throat> hey, Janet, hey, your hand is still up. Janet? It's, it's a new hand. If, if I was I was going to hoping to go after Karen. So well, any... oh, okay. we're going to have to have Karen see what she can do. Okay. It looks like maybe she left the meeting and maybe she'll come back in. I still see her here. All right. No, Karen, we still can't hear you. No. So Janet, why don't you go ahead and ask your question and we'll check back in with Karen in a minute. Okay, so one of the things I've been doing as part of my solar bylaw working group, I've been calling planning directors, you know, from different towns that have had a raise and also, you know, adopted bylaws. And one of the problems almost everybody cited was um, like when, you know, like having implementation because they're often small towns with small staffs and there's the plan and then there's what the, um, how it's built and those often don't match. And so um, I was gonna recommend that the ZBA hire a consultant as a construction monitor, um, which I think is also gonna be, a, I mean, I know it's a recommendation of some people on my group, um, but I also wondered like what's going on at Hickory Ridge? Cause I understand that the implementation of the natural heritage program permit did not, was not being followed this summer. And then the project was shut down because of that. And so, I, you know, I'm wondering, you know, you're coming here back to Amherst, you have a project that seems sort of stalled and stopped. And then someone recently sent pictures, I don't know if you've seen them over the weekend of, you know, all these flood control barriers and stuff that were breached by the rain over the weekend. And so my recommendation, you know, is not just to look at the site, you know, occasionally or once a year, but to make sure it's it's working and to you know constantly monitor after major rains, which I think would be a wetlands permit requirement also of the town. So if you could just talk about Hickory Ridge and what's what has happened and mistakes made and corrections made and what you've learned from that, because you know you have a few projects, or at least your uh, your project company has some some bad, you know the Williamsburg thing was sort of a complete disaster, and I know the neighbors have raised this issue over and over again. And I'd be really good to hear exactly what has gone on and how you've remedied it. Well, I think I'll, I'll maybe turn that over to Attorney Reedy. Um, I will very much emphasize that we are not associated with the Williamsburg project. Um, I, uh, that was an unfortunate circumstance with the erosion on that project, which was very, very terrible. Um, but no, we, we are absolutely not associated with that project and certainly looking to, to build projects as um, safely as we can. But um, I'll turn it over to uh, Tom for a paper rich questions. Yeah, no, and I think I think the point Andrew made is probably the biggest point of misinformation out there and whatever sort of characterization folks want to try to tie pure sky to Williamsburg. There's just there's no tie is the contractor who is working on the Hickory Ridge project. The same contractor that worked at Williamsburg. Yes, but pure sky had no relationship with that contractor in Williamsburg. And as everybody can appreciate, the story is a little bit more involved than just, you know, what you read is, okay, dynamic, who's the contractor, did something or didn't do something, and then Williamsburg happened, right? So I'd like to kind of bring focus back to the project that's in front of the planning board, which is technically in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, you know, I talked to the folks over at Pure Sky about this past weekend at Hickory, and, you know, they've been talking to the, the Conservation Commission, to Aaron, particularly, and just working through it with them. I think the, the location of the trailer and the generator, right, now they know it doesn't go in that location, and so they're going to move it. But, you know, I just want to be sensitive to not dwelling on, th these are just really, frankly, two different sites. Um, I mean, Hickory is what it's right along the Fort River. Um, we have had uh, an inordinate amount of rain this summer. I mean, I, I forget how much we've had, but it's certainly multiple times more than we've usually had. Uh, and this is the first instance of something at Hickory Ridge. But I, I just, you know, through the chair, maybe want to move to this project on this lot in North Amherst, just so that we can start to ferret out anything 
for the Zoning Board of Appeals, you know, on this project. Right. Thanks, Tom. Um, well, I do think that that is appropriate that we focus on Hickory on uh, on the uh, Shutesbury Road project. But I think you 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 all on the applicant team need to be aware that there is where certainly uh, it's easy to associate uh, mishaps on other projects, particularly other projects in town, uh, with with you as an as a team and you know more broadly as an industry. So uh, you know don't make it too easy for people. Uh, you know, or be careful when you do. Um, no, and we hear and we hear you, Mr. Chair. I'm not trying to skirt it. I just want to, you know, we've got limited time. We want to focus yep. on that. If okay. Ms. McGowan right. wants to talk, I'm happy to talk about it offline with her, uh, you know, set her up with Pure Sky if she wants to talk to them. Right. I'd actually like to ask a follow-up question if I could, because I feel like the question wasn't answered. Well, okay. So, so. Uh, Janet, you just click hit the mute. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It's, an, it's a bad night. So you're working with dynamic energy that was part of the, yeah, the extreme difficulties at Williamsburg. You're working with Pure Skies, working with dynamic energy at Hickory Ridge. There have been problems with the natural heritage program that stopped the work because the, the order wasn't followed. Can you, someone just say, yes, that was a problem and we fixed it? Because you're sort of saying, oh, let's focus on this next project. And we have an ongoing project with the same actor, actors and with problems. And I think, you know, if I was a person in that neighborhood, if I'm just a resident of Amherst, I'd like to know people, what are the problems? Were they fixed? And what, you know, I, I don't know what, it seems like it's, it's sort of evading the Hickory Ridge problem with the natural heritage program. Permit. Yeah, so through the chair, I mean, frankly, I don't know about it and we can find out and I'm not trying to hide anything. I just, I can't even tell you, yes, there was an issue. No, there wasn't an issue. And if there was an issue, here's the issue. Who Here's who didn't do what, like I can find out and, and then let you know. Um, I well, just, I still want to distinguish, um, you know. The, um, the we also project. have Nate uh, here. And I guess I, I wondered, Nate, do you have any <clears throat> familiarity with what, happened with the natural heritage project at Hickory Ridge? So you're asking, uh, I don't know if my video is working. You're asking me what happened with natural heritage? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the town and the applicants filed and they worked through having, you know, areas set aside for, you know, management, for revegetation. I mean, I don't, I'm, as far as I'm aware, there wasn't like any, any issues. I could check with Aaron, but, you know, they have a plan um, a pretty thorough plan with the state natural heritage that encompasses the whole property and they have specific areas that they you know need to be managed certain ways. There's a conservation restriction involved. Um, so they work through it. I don't, I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't know that there's any like issues other than that. There's a, a pretty comprehensive plan that has to be followed. Um, okay. Aaron, Aaron Jake is in the audience actually. Well, I don't, I don't want this to, to become a big review of the, the Hickory project. Um, you know, we're not here for that purpose tonight. And certainly there's other avenues in which the issues at that project could be discussed. So I'd just as soon not do that. Um, I do want to ask you guys, uh, and I think it would be very helpful for the ZBA. Uh, the, the schedule that you show is pretty opaque as far as how the different steps and phases happen. Um, you know, I think you could do a lot, rather than using a screenshot from Primavera um, to have something that's a little more legible for the, the, per, the layman. Um, you know, for instance, right now, I'm actually unclear as to whether you're going to clear 41 acres of trees leave them on the ground, and then 10 acres at a time, you're gonna remove the trees and start to grub the, each, each zone, or whether you're gonna do 10 acres of tree clearing at a time. And when you go to, when you go to phase two, then you'll 
uh, remove the trees associated with that. So I don't need to know all of that right now, um, but right now I'm just seeing kind of, you know, one, one long line of 245 days of construction and civil doesn't mean much to me as a layman. I want to see what are you doing? You know, one first line is tree, tree cut down. The next one is clearing and grubbing. The third one is sowing wildflowers. The fourth one is seeing that the wildflowers have germinated, which you're going to get some, you might have something in 30 days in the spring, but if you do it in July, you know, in 30 days, I'm not going to believe you if you think the, the flowers are all there, particularly if you don't have some other water source. Um, and it, given the rains we're having, it could all wash away in the summer. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding really what I, you know, it's hard for me to picture what you've got right now. Um, so that's a, a comment that doesn't need to go to ZBA, but I think if you want to have everybody understand what you're really talking about, you could lay out the sequence and uh, be more clear about that. Sorry about my video here. Uh, that's um, extremely helpful feedback. Thank you. I'm taking some notes. Okay. All right, Janet, I'm, I'm sorry to sort of steer the conversation away from Hickory, but I, that's really not why we're here. Um, you know, I suppose we could ask, are you planning to put generators or construction trailers in, a, in any swales, you know, so that what we saw at Hickory doesn't happen again. But, you know, is that, that's a question about this project. To my understanding, no, that that would not be something we would do on this site. I would, I would definitely want to confirm with our construction manager on that, but we would, we would certainly um, make sure that there's, there's no uh, impact of that nature kind of on this site. Mm -hmm. Okay, Karen, you want to try your video, your verbal again? Ah, no. no. So Karen, you might try phoning into the meeting. Mm -hmm. Use your cell phone and come in as another participant. And, you know, we can't hear you. No. Nope. Oh, sorry about that. All right, Janet, let's try it again. Anyway, so I'm not going to belabor Hickory Ridge. Um, obviously, you shouldn't put things in floodplains, especially in the modern era. Um, I think the issue of following plans and delivering on them is really key. Um, I do, you know, along kind of what Jesse was saying is, you know, when I look at this site as a plan, I do look at those two smaller um, arrays that are surround the um the battery storage. And it it just seems like you've gone all the way around the wetland and there's water resources and you know there's resources to the other, you know, to the west and the north. And it, I wondered if it would be a stronger plan and have fewer trees being cut if you just kept the two larger fields, the solar array fields. Um and it'd be kind of less disruption to the habitat, to the to everything. So that, that was a that's a piece of feedback. I would like to see um, before making recommendations, you know, the lengthy comments by the CONCOM because I, you know, I have a lot of respect for that committee um, and their expertise. So I think that would be an important thing to know. All right, thank you, Janet. All right, um, so Andrew, did we get through the material you hoped to present? Yes, sir. Um, I the presentation was essentially a kind of a place placeholder starter for us and to open up to questions. And so uh, I'm happy to continue fielding questions, but that's the material we wanted to share with you all tonight. Okay. All right. So it is eight o'clock and we typically take a break around that time, but I, I see Fred's hand. So Fred, why don't you give us your questions? Fred, you are muted. Lord. There you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, am I coming through now? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question about fencing. Uh, I've been through the uh, 
the packet, um, and there's a number of references to fencing, but I, I may have just been unable to discover it, but uh, I didn't see any specification. And uh, I'm uh, wondering if you could comment on uh, what uh, you're planning to do as far as restricting uh, access to this. All right, Andrew? Yes, thank you. I will turn that over to Steve or Chris to speak about the fencing. It'll be a uh, seven foot high with that six inch gap at the bottom fence around the perimeter. Um, but I'll let uh, Steve and Chris to provide more detail there. Yeah, that's that's exactly Andrew. And the uh, the details are on um, C5, uh, sheet C5.00 of the, of the plan set. But uh, Andrew uh, described it. Seven foot high chain is link. A, is that a Se chain link fence? Seven foot high chain link, that's correct. All right, I'm not seeing C5 was not included in our package, at least as mailed to me. So that may be why Fred didn't see it. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's posted on the ZBA website. Um, oh, here we go. Yes, and so just sharing my screen quickly, if it's if it's helpful for yep, the board. That's great. Um, this is the the fencing that was referenced. Um, sorry, my computer's a, oh, sorry about that. My computer's a little slow. Um, right here, I I can zoom in further in any aspects that are helpful. But this is the oh, of course my computer. Um, this is the the are the aspects of the the fencing itself. Okay. Fred, do you have other questions? Uh, no, thank you for for that. I th I uh, my curiosity is uh, I think that I'm pretty sure that will comply with the relevant provisions of the National Electrical Safety Code, which is the uh, relevant document that uh, needs to be applied to this uh, particular uh, work. It 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 does. Okay. All right, so uh, not seeing any hands at the moment. I think, why don't we take our five minute break uh, and come back. I see the time now as 8.04. Let's come back at 8.09 and, and resume the conversation. Board members, we should start thinking about whether we want to make a recommendation to ZBA at all or whether or not, and if we do want to, what we should recommend. So we can talk about that when we come back. Uh, please turn off your camera and mute yourself uh, during the break. And, uh, and when you return, please turn on your camera so that you, we can see your back. Thank you.
Karen, did it was that you I heard? Uh, humming. Mm. Hello, who is who? Who did I just hear? It could have been Pam. Oh, okay. No, it's not me. <laughs> There's a Hummer. <laughs> Car Karen was the only one that looked like she was not muted. Do you know? I wonder if we could. I don't know if I had, I, should I text her the phone number of the meeting? That might be a good idea because it's, I, a, it's, it's a lot. When I'm online, it's really hard for me to like switch with my computer and yeah. have any, yeah. let me find it. Actually, yeah. it's on the, it's on the, um, it's on the agenda, isn't it? No, no, no it's, on, it's, it's on the posting. Okay. And I was terrible that she couldn't. All right. Here yeah, we, I mean, we could hear her at the beginning. It's weird. Okay, so, all right. Our phone number is 646-931-3860. And then you have to put in a meeting number, right? No, you know what, you just, I've done this, I did this when I was in the parking lot in British Columbia. You just, you just, they tell you to do something and you don't and they just send it to you, they let you in. Oh. I'll, I'll text her right now. All right. All right. So people are coming back. Wait, I don't have her cell. Dang. I, I did. Is there a chat option by any chance? Could she type her question in? Does anybody have her cell? Yeah. Um, Corey, the uh, chat option is not enabled on the town of Amherst's Zoom platform. Oh, well, we're a little afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that way, every everybody has to pay attention to the whole conversation, and they can't be chatting between themselves. Oh, I see. <laughs> at, least on, at least on Zoom. <laughs> That's a better, a better. Can I interrupt, Janet? Do you have that number that you were going to send to Karen? Yes, I do. It's six four six nine three one. Three eight six zero. Okay, thank you. All right, so it looks like most people are back. I will flash my video here just to show everybody that I am back. However, the way can it you might... hear me? Yes, we can. Karen, oh. yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So Yay. now that let's see, we we don't have Fred back yet. Karen, stay with us, and we'll let you start us off with your question oh um so corey and andrew do you want steve to be back before we resume the conversation and chris if um if there's a, a technical based question i think i'd like to just get their their um answer because i certainly wouldn't want to okay. speak um, but any other question i'm happy to field with corey's help Okay. All right. Well, um, Karen, why don't you go ahead and ask your question and we'll see whether Andrew wants to field it without referring it to Steve or Christopher. Okay. Can you still hear me? Oh, yes. yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. So my question was simply, can you point to 
uh, a project of this size, 43 acres, which has been successful. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, just, just to clarify, uh, just so I'm understanding the, the definition of successful, do you mean successfully constructed and operating on the electric grid? Um, yes, and uh, without problems, without major problems, erosion, that's, uh, just something that's been running for a while that you can point to and say, this is what we've done. It's of this magnitude, and we've done all these uh, mitigation things, and uh, you can look at it and study what people think of it has hit um, met expectations, and if not, what are the major problems? In other words, what 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 can you show us that uh, will fill us with confidence? Is there or is this so new that that's difficult to do? That's that's a great question, a reasonable question, certainly. I, I'm happy to provide a list of projects we've developed and built that are functioning today. Um, I don't have one to pick off the top of my head, but I'm very happy to provide that. Uh, the industry, um, I'd say, has been around in force for maybe about 20 years or so. Uh, it, you know, as you can imagine, started off small, it's kind of branched out from there. Uh, but over the last uh, 10 years or so, it's, it's, uh, there's been a quite, quite a lot of activity on uh, what we call you know, community solar or larger solar. So we can, we can certainly uh, find projects that are kind of a similar size to this to, to show the board for, um, you know, to well, talk Andrew, about. I mean, I want to press you a little bit on that. You know, yeah. we, we had conversation before the break about another project, which uh, has had some issues. Uh, actually, a couple projects got mentioned, and some of the same players were involved. Um, I, you know, I'd be interested to know, you know, have you done a project with this team of this size that didn't have major issues with site and, uh, you know, water quality and, and all the kinds of things we're talking about? Um, I assume that most of your projects do end up, end up connecting to the grid, so there's success from an electrical point of view, but uh, the board is clearly interested in some of the ancillary potential impacts of the project. And I would hope your team has done, you've worked with this group before and that you've done a project of this size. So that's, I think where Karen's coming from. Sure, sure. Yeah, we've, um, I mean, one project we've worked with this team on before is, is designing some aspects of a project in uh in town of uh, brookfield west brookfield uh, a certain aspect of that or, and not the uh much of the project footprint itself but some of the the ancillary features of that project uh which has gone very well and we're proceeding with um but i mean as with anything as you can imagine you know unexpected things come up especially in dealing with um construction so it's it's the focus to try to be as safe as possible and to remediate as quickly as possible if something does occur, which is why I think it's, you know, we're fully on board with working with the town for any sort of monitoring and checking on the project throughout the, the process. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know if that accurately answers your question, but um, yeah, we very confident in the team and we wouldn't be pers pursuing this project with uh, anyone else. You know, we're, we're very confident in, in the, the product here and, the design, I think it's top notch. Okay, so uh, Karin, would you like him to send a list of projects that may be just limited to projects in Massachusetts? Um, yes, or, or it doesn't have to be a long list. I'd be happy just one or two of this size where you've cut down 42 uh, acres of trees and um, what? how long has it been running? And has this met your expectations? And has this gone relatively smoothly without any huge things? I mean, when this, this I realize this is new and it's very controversial whether you want to cut down this many trees to have solar. Uh, and I, I'm no expert on it, but I would be certainly reassured to know that you have done this kind of thing, cut down 42 acres of trees and met the expectations that that you're hoping to in a project of this size. 
Absolutely, I'm happy to provide. Uh, a All few right. Questions. Yeah. So, Andrew, uh, would you please send that information to Chris Brestrup? Yes. And she can distribute it to the rest of the board. Yes. And uh, okay. All right. So um, I think at this point it might make sense to have the public comment that we're going to have associated with this. Uh, it might influence how, what kind of recommendations we want to make. And so I'm going to uh, offer the attendees. Uh, I see we have still 17 attendees. And uh, I'd like to have all of them who want to make a public comment uh, raise their hands. I'll wait while everybody figures out how to find the raise hand function. So far, I see two people who would like to make comments and 15 people that don't want to make a comment. OK, all right, so. I see Michael Lipinski and Lenore Brick, who would like to make comments. And uh, Pam, why don't we bring Michael over? Since we only have two people who want to make comments, why don't we allow them each the full three minutes that we usually uh, have for public comments? And uh, you've got your uh, timer up there. Let's bring Michael over. Uh, Michael, would you give us your name and remind us of your address? And you have three minutes for a comment. And uh, thank you for joining us. Yes, my name is Michael Lipinski, 167 Shoots Ferry Road. And uh, let's see if we can cover a lot of territory here really quickly. Uh, first of all, Karen, if you want to do some research, look up Dwaynesburg, New York. This is an amp project. Project. It's in New York. It wasn't done by Dynamic, but last winter, uh, halfway through the project, solar panels were out there. They left them in the wrong position. And in December, a heavy snow came and destroyed rows and rows and rows. Hundreds of solar panels were knocked down and destroyed due to incompetence. Those solar panels, a lot of them are still laying there. Look it up. There's not a lot out there to find, but it's there. Dwaynesburg, New York, a real mess. I still don't think they restarted the construction there. Amp's in charge of that. Uh, let's talk about the trees being cut down. I asked that question about a month ago to Andrew. I got the same runaround that you got. Um, well, we don't know, we're not sure. They're working with a forestry group. The forestry group doesn't know how many trees are on an acre around here. Come on, it's an important number. Do a quick estimate, go out in the woods, look at about an acre, count the trees. Use 100, that's 4,100 trees. Use 200 on the, on the acre, that's over 8,000 trees. Those are the numbers you're dealing with in a town that's really proud when they plant 18 shade plants on a main street someplace. Um, the pole and battery that they showed tonight, that same Poland battery burst into flames a little bit after imp implementation in Warwick, New York last summer. Uh, at the last ZBA meeting, the battery guy showed up. They promised that there'd be a report pretty soon explaining why that battery burst into flames. There's no report that I know of that's been released by anyone. The town of Warwick had those batteries removed. The batteries they had removed are the same ones you saw on the screen tonight that they're recommended both at Hickory Ridge and Shootsbury Road. I know that certain people want to dodge around what's going on at Hickory Ridge and make believe it's not important, but it certainly is a tryout for this project. It's a much easier site to develop and it's just been one delay after another there. The business about having a generator and the trailer and the floodplain, it's not a mystery that was a floodplain, it's right on the map, floodplains flood. They put it there, they knew it was gonna flood. These are the people you wanna trust putting together that super complicated phasing map that you saw today. Can you imagine 
This is a company that puts a trailer and a generator in the floodplain, and you want to trust them with that super complicated phasing plan. All right, last Michael, thing, you are one the last end. thing about the access road, Mr. Reedy, Michael. I think needs to update his information. That is an intermittent stream. The, the water commissioner has declared it an intermittent stream. You're not going to be able to dodge it. And it's going to have to be part of the access road plan. Okay, thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Pam, would you bring over Lenore Brick? Hi, Lenore. Hello, Lenore. Hi. Would you give us Hi, guys. and Hi. your Can street address, please? Uh, 255 Strong Street, Amherst. Thank you. So um, I uh, do appreciate that Pure Sky is trying to do this project responsibly. I believe that they believe that and that they're really trying to do a good job. But I'd like to talk about what's responsible. Um, and I have to point out that these projects on forested land are by their nature, not responsible if we're actually talking about the climate crisis. Um, we clearing 41 acres of forested land, no matter how responsibly it's done, is going to cause damage to the ecosystem. It's going to disturb the soil microbiology, which by the way, is where half the carbon is stored long-term. That carbon calculations of avoiding carb carbon equaling the stored carbon doesn't include the true costs of losing the free and valuable eco services that uh, healthy natural uh, systems provide. We're, we're kind of dealing with something we don't really understand because you don't have all the expertise that you need to do a project of this kind. It's not just an engineering project. It's not just a solar project. Maybe this project would make sense if we weren't living in an environment where habitat was already so fragmented, where we don't have enough forested land. And by the way, when that farmland from years ago that someone mentioned um, when we, when the colonists came here and deforested Massachusetts, that's when the problem started. That's when the climate started getting deregulated. So we live in a very compromised state where um, we, we don't have enough forested land now. The severe weather episodes we're seeing are commonplace. Let's be realistic. These floods and, re and the re that we're seeing in recent rains, the, they will continue. This is the new normal. And we're in this kind of weird time warp um, where we also have to be responsible, not only to project ourselves into the future, but to be in sync with what's happening on the state level. The state is finally catching up with the latest climate science that's understanding better the critical need to prioritize ecosystem health. All the studies that are coming out of the state now, all of them, the Dewar study, the, the study that Mass Audubon just did with Harvard Forest, the Forest's Climate Solutions Proposal, the Resilient Lands Initiative, the Healthy Soils Action Plan, all of the state plans are concluding and there's data are concluding that we should not be putting solar on green lands, but on built and disturbed landscapes. And not only that we should, but we can meet the climate goals in Massachusetts by doing that. Um, so, and the other thing I want to mention is, is in terms of water cycles, small water cycles are largely determined by by forests, so they will also will be affected. Even if the wells, even if you're saying the wells will be safe, our water cycles are going okay, to be are, affected. We are at three minutes. Yeah. So anyway, there's a lot to think about if you're going to consider permitting this project. You have to have that big picture also. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. One additional hand has uh, arisen, and that is from Renee Moss. Please bring her over and welcome, Renee. Uh, would you please give us uh, any additional parts of your name you want to share or or just your street address? Uh, yes, it's um, Renee Moss and 277 Shootsbury Road. And I basically, um, I, I wanted to say a lot of what Lenore said. Um, I just think, you know, we talk about this 40 plus acre um, project. And I know for me, it really came um, to it, it, 
it really came alive when I understood that that was equivalent to 30 football fields, clearing forest that's 30 football fields in size. And I just think it's the wrong project in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I wanted to speak more to it being the wrong time. And, but I think Lenore has already covered that about, you know, the state sort of, you know, the state has done a study, the state is changing its mind about where solar should go. It should go in the built environment. So we certainly, I'm, I'm just concerned that we don't want to jump the gun with a, with a, a project this size, this monumental for, for Amherst, um, when we're seeing the science changing, with we're, we're seeing the state changing its policies. So again, um, just to encourage you to sort of look more broadly and understand the full context about um, the world we're living in now and how things have changed and why this is the wrong project at the wrong time in the wrong place. Thank you very much and thanks for the work you're doing. Okay, thank you, Renee. So I don't see any additional hands. Just um, I, and. Uh, I guess I would like to make one comment, which is uh, I've been I was a little surprised to see that this 40 acre uh, development would only provide power for about 1500 homes. And I assume those are sort of typical homes in New England that have our heating profile and, and air conditioning profile. And if that math is right, uh, it suggests that, that, that in order to power Amherst with its, say, 15 to 17,000 homes, uh, not even counting the colleges and university, uh, we would need about 10 times this uh, quantity of uh, acreage of solar panels in order to power Amherst in a carbon neutral way. And so Okay, so 400 acres, and if it's not going to be on forests and it's not going to be on farmland, uh, are we going to take 400 acres of current single family homes and tear those down and replace those with solar panels? Um, you know, is there 400 acres of rooftop that's available for solar panels? Uh, uh, those are questions that come to my mind, and I see Janet's hand up. Uh, maybe you have answers from your experience on the Solar Bylaw Working Group. So I'm gone. I'm I'll, gone. Let you, I'll give the floor to you for a minute, but uh, you know, it's like, okay, we don't want to do it here, where, and it's the wrong project in the wrong place. Well, somebody needs to tell me where the right place is, and, so, um, and I haven't really heard that yet. Janet? So I, I don't know if you've all these things I've been sort of sending around, but the state did a, a statewide solar assessment and it found that it had 15 to 18 times the amount of solar it was looking for in its own state plans. And it was all in the built environment. And so that's encouraging news. I mean, rooftop solar is actually the cheapest solar to put in. And so, you know, the previous speakers are right is the state has two um, climate action plans huge push to protect natural working lands, forests and farms and grasslands and um, I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever's green and to expand the amount of forests and farms that we have to 40%. And um, for all the ecosystem services, it's also to sequester carbon because even if we went to zero E right now, we still have too much carbon in the atmosphere. And so you know, we don't have to say we need 400 acres of solar in Amherst to cover our needs because there's a plan and the plan is looking at different sources. But a, a huge part of the plan, one of the, you know, is to expand and, and protect forests. And the EOEA or EEOA, I always get that confused, just came out with a no net loss of forests and farms policy. And so there's been this huge, it, it, I wouldn't say it's like a shift that just happened, but you could see it coming down the pike in all these assessments and climate action plans. And the CARP, our own plan, is to protect natural working lands, farms, and forests, and put solar on the built environment. So that's our own town plan. No plan says Amherst has to produce all of its own energy from solar. No state plan or town plan is telling people how to get there, but these two plans are looking at different sources. The other good piece of news is that they don't really look at hydro much, and that's probably going to be a bigger part of the picture with Hydro Quebec finally having won their last lawsuit. So there is a path forward, 
And, you know, I think, you know, if we adopt the bylaw that's coming out of, you know, the solar bylaw work, working group, this wouldn't even be on the table because it's, um, you know, it's, it's priority lands for the state. It's, you know, critical habitat, core habitat, and then there is a local rare species on a small part of this parcel that we didn't even get to. So, I, you know, it's like, you know, I feel sort of, I feel, I, I feel mixed about it because under our current bylaw, if you get through the hoops, you can get there. I, I'd like to see this project be as strong as possible and have the least damage, maybe do some mitigation, but I don't think this, this is kind of probably the last one through the gate. That's my impression, given what the state is looking, you know, the numbers they're coming up with. Okay, I can't wait to see where the state thinks we ought to have solar in, in Amherst. Oh, I, I could I could show it to you. I mean, it's all it's all numbers and stuff, but we don't need 400 acres of solar. No one's asking us that. Okay. All right. Uh, are there other members of the board who want to ask questions or start the conversation about what kind of recommendation we might want to make to ZBA. Don't all raise your hands at once. All right, uh, Johanna, you got there first. Thanks, Doug. I was mostly, and forgive me if Chris said this in the beginning, but I don't remember her saying it, of just um, given that this is a public meeting, not a public hearing, what is the value add of the planning board's engagement in the ZBA process? So, um, you know, I know Chris is a little bit under the weather tonight. Um, Chris, do you want to speak? Go ahead. Yeah, I would say that the ZBA um, understands that the planning board understands land use issues and, you know, um, drainage and cutting of trees and just general land use issues <laughs> and values the planning board's um, input. Maybe Nate could give a better answer because I'm starting to lose my voice, excuse me. Okay, thanks, Chris. Nate, do you wanna elaborate on that? Uh, I mean, I think Chris said it pretty well. You know, oftentimes boards will seek advisory opinions from other town boards or committees. And so really this is something that the ZBA would use as part of their review. So if, if the planning board is concerned with Say the you know the um, phasing and sequencing of of cutting and grubbing and soil stabilization. That's just that becomes something for the ZBA to be aware of, and maybe they want third party review of that or have you know another discussion with Aaron and the Conservation Commission. And so, to me, it's like what are some major themes that can come out of this meeting that the ZBA would take under consideration? Is it you know it could just be in general that is this project. Um, of a scale that is something that needs to be looked at as as well? Is it, you know, technical things in terms of, um, you know, the fencing or distance from wells or, you know, streams? And so, I mean, those are the things I've been hearing, you know, maybe there's a, a dozen points that would be relayed in a summary memo um, that, you know, that could just be a summary of this conversation. And that's what goes to the ZBA or maybe members feel like there's specific things to mention now. I mean, that's kind of the way I see it happening. It becomes just a, you know, an advisory memo to the ZBA. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Um, and certainly, you know, staff's keeping track. We have the recording. We'll have minutes. So uh, those, those, you know, those documents could be shared with ZBA without a whole lot more discussion from the planning board. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. I think this is a really big project that's complicated. Um, and I was also confused about the phasing and what was happening when. And so, um, and I, I'm actually, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know prophecy, but I think this project's going to change a lot um, getting through the concom. And I, you know, so I, I would like to hear, see it again in a month and have a chance to look at the documents that we didn't get, like the long extensive comments from Aaron Jakes or the concom um, you know, I, I understand you're here to promote your project and, and I just think there's going to be shifts and changes. And so if we say, oh, we recommend this project, but do these things and the project really shifts. Um, so I basically, I'm not comfortable. I have a list of ideas to recommend to the ZBA. Um, 
but I don't, I feel like I want to hear, see the project again. I think it's really an important one and I think it's going to change. And I'm not sure I have all the information that's there that I'd like to look at. All right. Thanks, Janet. I guess uh, I'd want to sort of think a little longer about whether we wanted to bring the project back. Uh, I'd want to have a little more awareness of what else is on our agenda for this fall. But uh, certainly if it does change a lot, uh, we could ask Chris to uh, keep us apprised of how it evolves and whether our input would be of any value farther down the, down the line. Other, other board members? No, no hands. Chris, you are still muted. You will have um, the Jones Library coming in um, in the beginning of November. They submitted their application. Um, I don't think you've offered recommendations on the um, Pulpit Hill Road Ball Lane um, project, have you? To the Zoning Board of Appeals, it's an affordable housing project. Um, we will also be getting um, an application, not too soon, but in a few months from um, the Wayfinders project on Belcher Town Road and East Street School. Um, so those are you know pretty big projects that you're gonna be asked to look at and comment on. And certainly the Jones Library will come to you for a permit. The other two will be um, where you will be advising the Zoning Board of Appeals. Right. And there's no requirement for us to make a recommendation at all. We can just say, good luck, ZBA. Okay. Um, Chris. How about if I, Pam and I write up what we heard tonight and then come back to you at some future meeting and say, is this what you want to forward to the Zoning Board of Appeals? Because they're not in any hurry. They have a long way to go before they reach a yeah. conclusion about this project. I mean, I think you could put together a list of the dozen predominant issues or themes of the conversation tonight. And uh, you know, the questions from the planning board mostly concerned X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that's another way of saying we were most concerned about X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't imagine we got on too many things that they wouldn't think of anyway. But uh, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not seeing any more hands from the board uh, and um, no reason to prolong this. Um, Andrew and Tom, uh, I guess you could consider this a warm up. Um, I don't know I don't know how uh, much conversation you've had with ZBA so far, but uh, you know this is a lot of the same things. I mean, the, the phasing is the big one, and, and Aaron was very clear for us to think about seasonal starts and what sort of stabilization. So, yeah, this this was really useful. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the fact that you presented it as we're going to phase it, on its, you know, at first blush, that sounds like a great idea. But when you get into the details of, well, what are the real benefits yeah. of doing that? Okay, are you in fact doing, you know, sequencing it in a way to take advantage of those benefits? Um, seems to me to be a, you know, at least a major selling point on minimizing the potential for damage. Yeah. And obviously, we're all risk averse, and uh, so you know, we don't, we want a hundred percent assurance that it'll be perfectly safe. Yeah, and I think it's just us spelling it out. I mean, that's what we've heard. That's what we heard from Aaron. That's what we've heard tonight is just talk about the start, make it so clear that everybody can visualize exactly what this process is going to look like, you know, assuming there is an approval and as it unfolds so that then we can get into the nitty gritty of, of is that the best way to do it? Are there tweaks to make it better? But at least to say, this is what we think for each of these phases. This is the timeline for each of these phases. This is kind of the extent of it. Um, but I think you know we've heard that. 
um, somewhat loud and clear. And I think to us, even from the inspection services planning department, that has been the, the largest issue for, for us to tackle. So yeah, and, well, obviously town staff is going to have a was is going to feel a substantial responsibility to watch what's going on. So they at least need to know what the staffing demands are going to be, when you're going to need them, when you're going to be ready to have somebody drive by. And um, so, yeah, no, we and, you know, and that's all aside from the existential question of, is this the right thing to do with 40 acres of land in Amherst, which uh, I think, I think we should leave for ZBA to answer. Okay, uh, I see now a flurry of hands. We've got Chris and then Janet and then Karen. So Chris. So I just wanted to note that the Zoning Board of Appeals is going to be considering what topics they need to have um, third party review uh, on. And um, you know we have a recommendation list of recommendations for them uh, that we'll be giving to them before the October 12th meeting. And it includes things like, um, you know, uh, examining phasing and examining the um, erosion control, erosion and sedimentation control and examining the plan for um, stormwater management. So um, if there are things that you would like to suggest to the zoning board that they hire a third party reviewer and, and the way that works is that the, um, the developer puts up the money and we hold it in escrow and we hire somebody to do a review and that person is not part of the development team, but is hired by the town and then they give us a report or give the zoning board of appeals a report. So if there's any, you know, thing that you're particularly concerned about, you, you could we could add that to our list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Janet, you are next. And then um, Karen. I hardly endorse hiring third party reviewers and experts because it's it's a huge it's a lot, a big ask on town staff, a project this size. So I was going to recommend to the CBA that they look at the Amherst Water Supply Protection P Committee white paper, which has very specific recommendations that go beyond stormwater management. Um, there's also a developing stormwater management for solar arrays that are different from like what we usually do. And there's some sources of that um, that I think Chris has access to. I would hire third-party consultants to review the stormwater management plan, the phasing, the erosion controls, you know, impacts on wetlands. Um, hire a construction monitor um, to make sure, you know, the problem that these towns had was the plans, were, you know, there was a plan and it wasn't followed and the towns were don't have the capacity to go out every week or, or even the knowledge to understand how things are going. Um, I would rec recommend more frequent post-construction monitoring, particularly about erosion. Um, and, you know, I do think we need the ZBA should have a better understanding of what's happening at Hickory Ridge. I feel like it's become this like mystery novel. The only person who's ever answered that question directly has been from the Natural Heritage Program. But I think the ZBA has to understand what has gone well, what has gone wrong. And, you know, there's two of the companies here, you know, should be able to help us with that, too. I would ask the ZBA to consider mitigation for loss of habitat and ecosystem services. And then also I would recommend that the ZBA look at the draft solar bylaw requirements for submittals, design standards, you know, things about surety and, you know, bonds. So to make sure of the construction goes, you know, it's, it's a big document, but it's, it's what a lot of other towns are requiring. And that would give the ZBA a sense of, you know, all the information it needs. So that would be my recommendation, but I really would like to see this project, especially since I think it's going to um, change a fair amount after getting through, you know, the concom and the boards. Okay, thank you, Janet. Karen, uh, your hand came down. You don't want to try to talk again? <laughs> okay. All right. So. Uh, I guess with that, uh, we'll conclude this public meeting. Uh, the time now is 847. Tom and Andrew and all your team, thank you for coming. Um, appreciate the briefing and I hope this was an illuminating conversation. It was. Thanks everyone for your time. Excellent Good questions. Time. Appreciate okay. it.
Uh, somebody needs to get me more broadband access so my image doesn't keep fritzing out like this tonight. Okay, so as I said, it's 847. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda. That is old business, not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Do we have any of that, Nate or Chris or Pam? No, I'm, Chris? I'm not Chris? aware of any. Okay, Chris, I know you're under the weather. Feel free to drop out. I think we've gotten through the meat of the conversation tonight. Just, um, I don't know if it will come up today, Doug, but you had offered to be the CPA rep, and I wasn't sure if that was moving forward or not. Well, we will get to that when we get to committee and liaison reports. All right. Okay, the next item is new business, not reasonably anticipated. Anything on that? No? All right. Um, uh, Form A, A and R subdivision applications. Anything, Pam? No. All right. Upcoming ZBA applications. Any other controversial projects we want to talk about with <laughs> and maybe make a recommendation? I did learn about one. It is not controversial. Um, when I spoke to Rob Lachilla today, the planner, um, Whoops, come on. He told me that he expects this, this project to be like permitted in, in one session of um, public hearing. So it is a change of use. Mm -hmm. So the property at 62 Taylor Street, um, it is an existing two family. In 2013, it was, um, it did receive a special permit to be a non-owner occupied two family. Then in 2020, it was bought by the current owner who was primarily using it for family. Um, and then subsequently began to rent it, not aware of the fact that the special permit to use it as a rental um, didn't just travel along with the property. So, this is this is really just um, getting it done. It's going right, to be so it's yep. It's going to be sold. It's allowed in um, in the RG for this to be a non owner occupied uh, rental. There's two units in it. The first floor has a two bedroom unit that currently one tenant lives in, and the second floor is a three bedroom unit um, and it, with three tenants. Um, the pack, the application package came in extremely complete. Um, it's actually the seller and the buyer kind of going at it together. Um, they've got a uh, a letter from an abutter that actually shares the driveway. They they have an easement and shares the driveway. Who supports this? I mean, it really is just um, it's it's just getting the homework done. It it already operates as a non-owner occupied two family dwelling. This the the most recent owner wasn't aware that they needed to get the special permit. So they're just taking care of some laundry. All right. Um, okay, that's all I got. Okay. So uh, does anybody think we should see this? Uh, I I personally don't because it's not really a change in the physical environment. Um, Janet? So a friend of mine used to own this property. And I think I, when we were looking at the zoning changes in terms of, you know, uh, Mandy Johanneke and Pat DeAngelis, I kept on saying, there's not a great market for owner-occupied duplexes. And so she got a job in DC, um, tried to change it to non-owner-occupied duplex, was rejected by the ZBA. So she wound up moving. And then, you know, it was just really an expensive Thing until finally she was able to sell it. And so I think this is, I think just, I don't want to see this application, but it's an illustration of even if you have an owner occupancy requirement and you think that's going to keep your neighborhood kind of more, you know, with more year round residents, this situation comes up and the ZBA is probably going to let them out of it. And then actually in my friend's case, it was a hindrance to their ability to sell. So maybe other ways to control the composition of residential neighborhoods is what we need, not hoping that owner 
occupancy will be the cure that lasts forever. So I just want to make that point. But I've, I've been in that house and it's, you know, it's a nice house and it's a nice neighborhood. Okay. All right, Pam. So we will pass on that one. Okie doke. Not hearing from anyone else that they were intrigued. All right. Um, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. As I said earlier, um, we do have an application from the Jones Library. I don't yep. know if we actually put it into um, the town clerk's office or Munis, but that will probably be scheduled for um, sometime in early November. Okay. And I don't know if Pam has anything more to say about that. I don't. Um, we did bring it in. It's got a number. It's in the log. It has not been submitted to the town clerk yet. Um, but I, I'm sure that it probably will by the end of the week. So it okay. is coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nate? Yeah, I was going to say there's um, probably two town projects that would be coming for site plan review as well. Uh, the town is looking at, we have uh, grant funding to put trails on Hickory Ridge. Uh, one's an accessible trail loop and one's a connection from East Hadley Road down to the um, Pomeroy Village intersection. And so that'd be a site plan review that we'd like to get submitted um, I don't know, this year. Uh, just because the plans are getting finalized. And then another one might be for um, uh, pickleball court and parking improvements at uh, Kiwanis Park on Stanley Street. So again, there's some funding there. The town's working on plans to make some improvements to that recreation area. Well, I'm sure Johanna will be very interested in that. <laughs> okay. All right, so we'll move on. The time is 8.54. Move on to committee and liaison reports. I know Bruce is absent, so we'll skip the PVPC. Uh, CPAC, uh, Nate, I can report that I received the, the letter of appointment uh, today from Angela, and I need to go into town hall and get sworn in. So that's where that's where that stands. Oh, good. Yeah, no, thanks, because the proposals were due at the end of the, you know, end of September, and they'll be going you know, probably live later this or later this week or next week for everyone, you know, for the committee to review them. So, okay. Well, assuming I can get over there, you know, in the next week, I guess I can participate. Great. Um, oh, wait, design review board, Karen. Yeah. So we met on Monday and there are three brand new businesses that we're looking to, uh, uh, put up awnings that we discussed. One is Botanica, um, Botanica Homes on 191 North Pleasant where the blue marble was. They're going to come back on Friday. They have a beautiful awning, but it didn't quite fit in with the, with the skyline of the others. So that's one that's exciting. And I suggest everybody go and check it out because she's already in business and it seems really lovely. Uh, the second one is a little Taqueria del Pueblo, another Mexican restaurant, a little bit different, kind of sophisticated, and it's going 31 Boltwood Walk. They uh, wanted a really plain uh, awning that we approved. And then the third is something really special Julia Nolan Jewelry going in 40 Main Street, and she requested signs, um, window signs, and then a sign to be on the road. And she's she's designed or had someone design an absolutely beautiful uh, round sign, Julie Nolan Jewelry. So uh, it's going to beautify downtown. So it was exciting to be part of that. It's fun. All right. Thanks, Karen. It's it's nice to hear you're having a good time. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, <laughs> Janet, Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, allegedly, we have our last meeting next Tuesday, um, and we've been we've been reading through the changes, the, our final changes to the bylaw, but we you know still have some a fair amount of work to do on farms and forests which means Chris, which I'm kind of worrying about given her situation. So um, 
we and then we're also talking on Tuesday about like what the next steps are. And I I can't remember if I brought up the issue that the planning board wanted to see. I mean, would it be okay to wait a week or two before you see that bylaw? Or I don't I don't think we really discussed it, Chris. Did I think I mentioned it, but I can't remember now if it was this meeting or a previous one. We've met a bit lately. Uh, Chris, you are muted. I think the planning board should see it, but I don't know if they need to see it before the Solar Bylaw Working Group is finished with it because there are going to be a number of other groups that will be looking at it. Um, we're we're imagining that the CRC is going to um, be kind of moving it along. So I think the planning board can look at it when the CRC looks at it. Yeah. Okay. And Janet, if if that's your last solar bylaw working group, there's still time for you to become the CPAC representative if, if you're <laughs> done with that. You know, you know. <laughs> just say it. Just say it. I think I, I think I'll defer. It seems like you you're already you're already there. You're you already got your letter. You're you're uh, ready. it's all happening. Horses out of the barn. Yeah. I find it really hard to believe that Tuesday is the last day. So I'm I'm still you know anyway. All right, Fred. I see your hand. Uh, yeah. Um, I made mention at the last meeting of uh, regarding the reference to the National Electrical Code in the model bylaw, which I is also in the state model bylaw, and that reference is simply wrong. Uh, it's the wrong code, and uh. Uh, we we need to fix that. It's a simple thing to fix, but we need to fix it. And uh, Chris, I remember you were saying you were going to set up a meeting with the electrical inspector. And so I'm, I'm, I have the uh, uh, National Electrical Safety Code, uh, the relevant requirements printed out. I'm happy to share that with, with you folks uh, uh, to make that simple. But uh, yeah, that has to get fixed. It really does. Okay. Uh, I, I say that as the person who's the secretary of the committee that uh, implements the National Electrical Code in Massachusetts, and the National Electrical Code does not apply to these. So. Okay. Chris, I see your hand. Fred, maybe Fred could um, email me sometimes in the next week that he could, um, well, it would have to be before Tuesday, or call me. Um, I'll, I'm going to try to go to work tomorrow, so I'll have a mask on, um, so Fred can call me and tell me exactly what the reference should say, okay? All right. I'll do that. I'll do that. And I suppose you could email some of that information, at least. That would be fine, too. Yeah, and I assume that uh, town staff is not working on Monday? We're not technically working on Monday, but some of us may need to. Some of you may creep into the building and quietly mm. do extra work. Of course. Tisk tisk. Fred, your hand is still up. Uh, do you want to say anything else? Okay. All right. Um, so now we're up to CRC. Chris, anything else you want to say about the CRC? Oh, no, not really. I haven't been attending their meetings, but they are they did look at the rental registration bylaw there's some other thing that they're looking at but i can't remember it off the top of my head my head isn't working as well as it normally does um is it the nuisance bylaw nuisance bylaw thank you pam that's it you're welcome nuisance okay. house bylaw. yep all right and chris if you're not attending those meetings should we have this on the agenda um when zoning bylaw amendments come up, then I have to go to the CRC so we could scratch it for now. And then when a zoning bylaw amendment comes or, up. Or I guess we could just leave it on here and you could say, you know, what you said no tonight. You haven't, you haven't been there. There hasn't been any zoning discussions. Okay. All right. Uh, I, next item, report of chair. I don't have anything in particular to say tonight. Chris, anything from staff or Nate or Pam? 
I don't have a report. Do Nate or Pam have a report? No, I'm seeing all three heads shaking now. No. Okay, all right, time now is 9.02. Uh, unless anybody has any else, anything else they'd like to bring up, uh, I think we can adjourn. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for Thank your you. thoughtful discussion about this, the uh, Shutesbury Road project. Great. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Good, night. Um, Good night. Bye. What is that? Stop recording. Good night, Pam. Good night, Mr. Marshall.